Okay, so let's start from the beginning. We always start with the hematopoietic stem cell, HPSC. And from there, we go to the common lymphoid progenitor cell, the common myeloid progenitor cell, and from the common myeloid progenitor cell, we either go to the granulocyte monocyte progenitor cell or the megakaryocyte erythroid progenitor cell. From here, we diverge again, and let's start on the top. We go from a megakaryoblast that's in the bone marrow cavity, and then we finally become the megakaryocyte, which is going to be for our platelets. On the bottom, we have our erythrocyte progenitor cell that goes through our erythrocytosis, which is right here, and we'll go over that in a little bit. And finally, we come out with our mature erythrocyte in the bone marrow, and this is going to be our red blood cell. Let's go a little north here to the granulocyte monocyte progenitor cell. We have our predendritic cell, our monocyte progenitor cell, our basophil mast progenitor cell, or excuse me, our basophil mast cell progenitor cell, yes, and our xenophil progenitor cell, and our neutrophilic progenitor cell. So you'll notice that we have a special thing going on right here, which we'll cover, which we, um, before we become a, a real neutrophil, we are essentially a band neutrophil, and we'll learn about that in a little bit in lymphopoiesis or uh, granulopoiesis, excuse me. So lymphopoiesis, we have three different determinations here. We are pre-T, pre-B, pre-NK. And from here, the only thing of note is that our B cell is before our plasma cell. Now, one thing to note is that I'm gonna draw a line down here. I'm gonna draw a line down here. So this right here is tissue. And this right here is blood. So all of these are going to be in blood. And if you see the same thing that goes on in the tissue, most likely it did not go undergo a transformation. It was the same as it was in the blood as it is in the tissue. So of note, we have several different distinguishing characteristics for here. We have B cell becoming plasma cell. We have our monocyte becoming macrophage and tissue. We don't really have a phase for mast cell aside from just in tissue. And our neutrophil went from a band neutrophil to a mature neutrophil. You notice it matured in the blood. We went from band to neutrophil, and then once it goes in the tissue, it stays the same. Megakaryoblast in bone marrow became megakaryocyte. And our red blood cell underwent a lot of different changes. And if you recall from last lecture, those changes included removing the nuclei, removing the organelles, and essentially becoming a mature red blood cell in order to produce um, hemoglobin, or rather have hemoglobin incorporated in it in order to transport oxygen and CO2. blood cell timeline. Well, here's a mnemonic for you. Nobody eats my plate right before lunch, okay? So starting off, we have our neutrophils. Neutrophils are in circulation for six to eight hours after they've matured from a band neutrophil, and they last in the marrow for, they, excuse me, mature in the marrow for two weeks. Eosinophils last circulation eight to 12 hours, and they take the same amount of time, two weeks, to mature in the bone marrow. Monocytes, 16 hours to many years years guys that's a lot of time and it takes about two to three days in the bone marrow in order to mature which is great because our monocytes go into macrophages in our tissue and they're the recyclers and the main um, immune system for our humoral immunity platelets last for about 10 days and they take about five days to mature which is another good plus because we have microvascular um, hemorrhages all the time and we need the platelets in order to plug and coagulate red blood cells good 120 days that's a magic number, 120 days. You need to know that number. Red blood cells take 120 days, and they take about seven to eight days in the bone marrow to create. Okay, so usually whenever you go into a um, high altitude environment or some type of oxygen deprived environment, it usually takes you about eight to ten days for, um, or excuse me, seven to eight days in order for you to accommodate to that condition because it takes seven to eight days to make more red blood cells. And you'll learn about that with BPG and physiology with that. If, um, if you recall from scientific foundations, you'll discuss that later on in physiology in later semesters. So basophils, um, they last for about 9 to 18 months, which is good. Basophils, and we can just uh, mast cells. And remember, mast cells and basophils are responsible for creating an inflammatory cascade in the tissue. So um, they usually take about two weeks in the bone marrow to, to produce and to mature. And finally, our lymphocyte can take from days to decades in circulation, and they take about two to three days to be created. But that does not mean that it takes two to three days to activate. So what I mean by that is that lymphocytes, as we'll see later on, they get separated into NK, T, and B. And so it takes about, let's say, seven to 10 days for these to mature. And when they mature, that's when they can actually do all the special things that they can do.
So fighting and our pathogens, fighting viral infected cells, intracellular and extracellular, um, I guess, combat, they, it takes them that much time to mature. The T cells are going to be in the thymus, and our B cells are going to be in the bone marrow. Okay? And they undergo several different types of maturation processes, which you'll cover and we'll cover together actually when we cover the immune system, and I'll be teaching that as well. development of hemopoiesis well first off we have multiple colors right so we have yellow we have blue green and red all right so first off number one always and forever is the yolk sac and let me change colors to black so that's one color that's not being used so the yolk sac is number one number two is going to be the liver okay very important that you know this graph very 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 important you need to know it for anatomy and you need to know it for histo number three is going to be the spleen and number four is going to be the bone. And what is this telling us? Well, number one, blood islands form in the yolk sac. And essentially what a blood island is, it's during fetal development, you have these essential pools of blood. And on the inside, you have hematopoietic stem cells. And on the outside, all right, we'll just hematopoietic stem cells, remember HPSC. And on the outside, you have these stem cells that can create vasculature and cartilage and muscle and all sorts of things. So what's happening is, is that we have our hematopoietic stem cells migrating f into and creating in the yolk sac. And all you need to know about the yolk sac right now is that is the most primordial part of our embryological development where essentially everything comes out of. Next, we have <clears throat> hematopoietic centers in the liver. So during the middle of the first trimester, the yolk sacs are starting to become less of an area where we can create our stem cells, and the liver starts to take over for the time being, while the other organs are forming. So early fetal development, so during the second trimester, the liver is the predominant place. Well, we also have um, other red blood cells and other cells being created in the spleen at this time because the spleen is starting to develop and it's starting to the body starting to need more and more so the spleen has to pick up the slack that the liver is not being able to accomplish so you'll see here that early fetal development the liver starts to begin at, towards the end of the first um, trimester beginning of the second trimester that's where it happens at um, you don't need to be specific, just know the general form. Yeah, obviously, the liver isn't the first thing, it's the yolk sac. Then it's the liver, then it's the spleen. And finally, when the bones start to form the long bones, you have bone marrow and lymphatic tissue. It happens in the red bone marrow. And this afterbirth, only where the liver have um, stopped its hemopoiesis. So where are our red blood cells made? Bone. Where are white blood cells made? Bone. Where is every cell, including our stem cells, stored at? Bone. Post post-birth or postpartum okay so this is where we make bone now this is where we used to make bone and that's where we first started to make bone and the spleen kind of jumped in the middle well we already saw this picture in last lecture and this is actually going to be the liver how can we tell it's the liver well we have central vein all right and what are these well, they're the parenchyma, which means the active, useful tissue of the, um, the organ that you're looking at. So this would be our, most likely our hepatocytes. And what are these spaces? Well, if you guess sinusoids, you are correct. And all that a sinusoid is, is a type of vessel that essentially is very open and leaky so that you can have all sorts of nutrients and blood cells um, going in and out and exchanging openly so that there's not a limitation or restriction on fluid flow. Now what about here on the left? If I told you this was an adult and this is a infant, and when I mean infant, let's change that terminology. This is a fetus. So you see a lot of red blood cells poking around here? Probably not. So you're not going to see a lot of red blood cells in the adult. So no red blood cells unless there's injury. This on the other hand is a fetal liver and we know it's a fetal liver because we have all these red blood cells in the sinusoids because as you recall we have the yolk sac, let me draw that line a little bit better, we have the yolk sac, then we have the liver, then we have the spleen, and then we have the bone marrow. So bone, spleen, liver, yolk, okay, YLSB.
YLSB. And so this right here would most likely be in the second trimester, and this is taken from a fetus. Okay. So what is bone marrow? Well, red bone marrow is within the medullary cavity of long bones. So we have our bone here. Sorry, not a really good bone. But we have our red bone marrow, and that's going to be in our medullary cavity, which is going to be right in the middle. Okay, and this is an anatomy lesson, but we have the epiphysis, we have the metiphysis, and then we have this area right here, and this is the diaphysis. And the diaphysis is going to have the medullary cavity. And in that medullary cavity, we're going to have our growing bone marrow as a fetus, as well as as an adult, this is where we store all of our blood cells that are going to need to replace anything if anything gets damaged. So in here, we also have the spaces of short bones as well as long bones. So the sinusoids and sponge-like network of cords of hematopoietic cells. So this is where we're going to have our hematopoietic stem cells. So I'll change the color to make sure everyone knows exactly where we're at. So HPSC. Over and over and over, guys, you've got to get used to acronyms. So sinusoids act as a barrier between hematopoietic cells and peripheral circulation. Okay, so that's good. So you see this blue line right here? That is going to be our barrier. So that way, if we do have bacteria or whatever, it can't get in because it's a barrier. Unique vascular unit equivalent of a capillary between the arterial supply and the venous drainage. So you'll notice that we have our little nutrient foramina where our red blood cells go in, or excuse me, our arteries go in, and they feed the inner bone. But there's this barrier, like we said before, in the sinusoids. So we have our arterial and we have our venous supply going in and out of these nutrient foramina and exchanging in our sinusoids. And essentially the sinusoids act like the barrier. And here are all our cells. And then we have our capillaries right here. We'll just make that the capillary. And then we have our arterial and our venous going in and then you can have cells exiting out. So it has an endothelium, basal lamina, and adventitial cells. So as we learned in epithelium, we had the top layer, which is going to be our epithelium, and then we have the layer that the epithelium sits on, which is the basement membrane. And our basement membrane is very important because that is what connects the epithelium to the underlying tissue. So as we see right here, here's where they would be connected to. And then our adventitial cells. Adventitial cells are also reticular cells, and they support for hematopoietic cells by sending extensions out and produce reticular fibers. So what that is, is that they help to organize and structure. So our epithelium cell will have broken up, and then we'll just say that one of these cells is going to be a special cell, and we're going to have our adventitial cell right here. An adventitial cell is going to send extensions out and within, or excuse me, just out, and it's going to reach, sample the environment, make sure that there's nothing needed, and it also secretes cytokines for blood development. So the adventitial cell is really important because it monitors the external environment and if there's other hormones, such as the erythropoietin, which is um, secreted from the kidney, then it can say, okay, well, we need more red blood cell production. Let's crank it up. And the erythropoiesis process will start. All right. On the left here, we see some arrows pointing to certain things. If you see a really big white viscous mass, that's going to be an adipocyte. Adipocytes are fat cells, okay? They have a lot of different functions, which we'll talk about in epithelium, but leptin, we have our um, blood pressure being controlled by them, actually, our appetite, very, very important cells. Then we have um, this cell right here. Now, we've already seen this cell. We saw a TEM image of it in the previous lecture, but I'll give you a hint. It makes platelets. Well, if you got the hint, you'd know that's a megakaryocyte. And omega karyocyte is very important because it's what provides our platelets. And if you recall, it takes about two to three days to make platelets and mature. And all it is is just a budding from this omega karyocyte into the endothelial wall into the sinusoidal cavity itself so that it can bud off into the pla um, platelets. Now, what are all these other cells? Well, we can identify some of them. Here's a neutrophil, neutrophil or a monocyte, lymphocyte, neutrophil for sure, lymphocyte, lymphocyte. Eh, that looks like a basophil. How can I tell? Well, they're in the stages of growth, which we'll talk about what lymphopoiesis means. So how do we know that's a monocyte? 
well, we got the the little horseshoe. And I think on the previous lecture, I identified one of these horseshoes as a neutrophil. Just know that if you see a horseshoe, more than likely it's going to be a monocyte. So no worries about that. So let's look here. Um, what is this? What is this space right here? Is it defined? Is it defined by cells? Well, if it's defined by cells, it's more than likely going to be a sinusoid. Now, how do we know if it's defined by cells? Well, look here. Is this defined by cells? No, it's just an empty space. That's going to be an adipocyte. All right, that's going to be an adipocyte. How do we know what this is? Is it defined by cells? Well, we kind of see a clear border. That would probably be a sinusoid. And again, adipocyte. Why don't we see adipocytes? Well, they're washed away with the stain. Whenever we have to fix and stain things, the alcohol that we use actually washes away the adipocyte, and we learned that in microscopy. So let's look right here. What's this area? Well, this is bone, and that is an osteocyte. All right. And when you cover bone, if you haven't already, you'll know that that's an osteocyte. It's an osteoblast that's been trapped in bone. Then we have this area right here, and that is going to be our periosteum. Okay, and periosteum means it just surrounds the bone, and this is where we're going to have our flattened osteoprogenitor cells. So I'm sure some of you may have already taken the uh, Moodle quiz or whatever they call it, and you'll have noticed that this picture was used in like what is the the, the layers and levels, and you're like, well, I have no idea. Well, it's osteoprogenitor cell, and then you have the marrow, endothelium, all that stuff. So just know that that's a hard question. But for the general purposes of what's going on right here, we know that's a megakaryocyte, that's a megakaryocyte. And this is pretty much zoomed out. I mean, we can kind of see, but we could be, stay here forever and try to identify cells. To identify, white blob equals adipocyte. Okay, then we have a very zoomed out picture. We can kind of see these big cells right here. That's going to be a megakaryocyte, uh, white blob, adipocyte, adipocyte, adipocyte. So you notice there's a lot of adipocytes in the blood marrow or the bone marrow. And that's important because adipocytes are a central reserve volume for um, ACE or triglyceride, fatty acids. And those triglycerides provide a lot of energy per unit, and they're lighter than glycogen. And so therefore, the bone marrow is very metabolically active because it's going to have a lot of production of our blood cells, and it needs a lot of ATP. And so what's going to happen is, is that these adipocytes are going to provide... ATP in the form of the TCA cycle so that we can perform other activities that make glucose but that provide energy for these cells, which you'll learn about in metabolism later on. So let's look over here, adipocyte, 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 adipocyte. What's that? Megakaryocyte. All these really dark nuclei with a thin rim of cytoplasm are going to be, if you guess lymphocyte, you're correct. So we see a lot of lymphocyte production in here. Remember I said that the maturation process for T cells happens in the thymus, but the maturation process for the bone or the B cells happen in the bone marrow. So you're going to see a lot more of B cells in the bone marrow than you would T cells because this is where we're going to have our uh, maturation for the B cells. Now, let's move on. Okay, so what is the monophyletic theory of hemopoiesis? Well, all blood cells originate from the hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, pluripotential stem cells, it self renews, it differentiates into other non blood cells like tissues and organs, which is great, and we have uh, the repair function, and it expresses all these crazy CD numbers, which you won't need to know right now, but you will need to know later. Okay, bone marrow has two colonies, the um, common myeloid progenitor cell and the common lymphoid progenitor cells. Remember, this includes NK, this includes T, this includes B, and the common myeloid is the megakaryocyte, all right, just say mega and RBC, as well as that other, which was the GMP, the granulocyte monocyte progenitor cell, which gave rise to DC, and gave rise to all of our granulocytes, which we covered earlier in the previous lecture, our neutrophil, our eosinophil, our basophil, as well as our mast cell, okay? I'm not leaving anybody out. And the lineage is dependent in restricted cells and dependent on the surface receptors as well as the progenitor cells. So, sorry for these arrows, I must have transferred into written or text speech whenever I transferred these notes over. So it reacts with the cytokines and growth factors. Very important. Cytokines and growth factors are essentially signals sent by cells 
in order to in make sure that the proper lineage happens with spe at specific growth factors and at specific times. So cytokines really are the determinant of what's going on. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so what are the kinetics of hemopoiesis? Well, mitosis happens um, at for the proerythroblast, the basophilic erythroblast, and the polychromatophilic erythroblast. So this is riding on the coattails of that other slide that we showed with erythropoiesis. So mitosis, very important that you understand this slide, okay? So mitosis happens at the proerythroblast, the basophilic erythroblast, and the polychromatophilic erythroblast. Division happens several times at each erythroblast. So we have our proerythroblast, and it can divide right here, and then those can divide. We'll just say that's a division. Those can divide. All right, so on and so forth. And then they become basophilic, and then those can divide, and those can divide, and those can divide, and those, can divide, and those are, so on and so forth. So you really get the maximum bang for your buck, especially with the um, proerythroblast being able to divide several times before you go to the next stage. And this is um, what we can consider a cytological um, amplification. And so by this being done, our red blood cells can maximize in a short amount of time, which remember is seven to eight days for maturation in the bone, in the uh, bone marrow. And then after that, we have 120 days of life, which then it will be removed by the liver or the spleen. Okay? So uh, there are no red blood cells in the bone marrow for storage. They're all out. And the spleen has a lot of bone marrow, or excuse me, red blood cells. So our spleen is a very, very um, vascularized organ. And that's the reason why if you ever have um, splenomegalia, which means large spleen, or if you ever have an injury to the spleen in which causes a lot of damage to it, you're going to have a lot of bleeding. So remember, red blood cell production as well as all these my mitotic kinetics are controlled by erythropoietin, which is secreted by the kidney. And erythropoietin is going to um, be in response to low levels of oxygen in the blood. So in case you go to an area where there's not a lot of oxygen or you are oxygen deprived, then you're going to be um, producing more erythropoietin in order to increase that red blood cell production in the bone marrow. So again, this acts on specific receptors on the surface of the um, erythro, excuse me, the erythrocyte progenitor cell in the bone marrow, and about lasts for 120 days. And at four months, they become old, and the macrophage system within the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow actually does phagocytosis and degradation of the red blood cell. So you're going to see the bone marrow does some degra degradation, but for the most part, liver and spleen are one and two. Not necessarily in that order. Usually it's the spleen that takes care of most of the stuff. So spleen, 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 spleen. Well, hematopoietic cells are inactive in the red bone marrow and contain developing blood cells as well as megakaryocytes, which we've already talked about. So megakaryocytes make platelets and our, blood, our developing blood cells go through erythropoiesis, and this is where we have our red blood cells. Remember, it's very important that you memorize the exact levels of maturation and what happens in terms of kinetics for our hemopoiesis. So also, we have mast cells, macrophages, and adipocytes, and um, the blood cells develop in nests or clusters. And so what that means is you're gonna have an area where we have lymphocytes, we have an area where we have erythrocytes, and there's not going to be a lot of bleed over, okay? So we can just cross that out. So newly formed blood penetrates the endothelium into the sinusoids. An aperture is formed to let them into the general circulation as the blood cell squeezes out or the macrocy microcyte leaks out as it pinches off of the uh, megakaryocyte. I said macrocyte, it's going to be the platelet, excuse me. So the megakaryocyte essentially pinches it off and becomes the platelet. So endothelium repairs and the aperture disappears. So step one, the cell tries to get out. Here's the endothelium right here. It squeezes out, all right? And we're gonna draw the cell just finally coming out. And there's gonna be a hole right here. And then number three, the cell is out. The hole starts to come back onto itself and the cell is released, okay? So yellow bone marrow, it looks like adipose and contains mostly adipose, and it's replacement of red bone marrow by fat. So there's really no role in blood cell formation. It can refer back to the red bone marrow, and it's very important because the red yellow bone marrow is a sign of age. So 
what are the components of erythropoiesis? Well, erythropoiesis, number one, has the proerythroblast, which I'm going to draw a little K here for kinetic reminder. Just remember, it's going to be responsible for mitosis. It's large, about 12 to 20 micrometers, and it's basophilic, so it has free ribosomes. So basophilic means blue, okay? Now, the basophilic erythroblast is the second stage in erythropoiesis. So we have heterochromatin, which remember, heterochromatin means no transcription. It's basophilic, so it's blue. And we have polyribosomes synthesizing hemoglobin. So an increase in hemoglobin is in the cytoplasm, and this imparts an eosinophilic, which means red. So number three is the polychromatophilic erythroblast. We have a eosinophilia and basophilia, and I forgot to add a little K here. Remember, K, we're actually going mitosis. K here, we're undergoing mitosis again. Eosinophilia and basophilia, which means that we're kind of in a transition area. The nucleus is smaller, and we kind of have a checkerboard pattern. This is distinctive of the polychromatophilic erythroblast. Number four is the erythrochromatophilic erythroblast. We're no longer doing mitosis. We're essentially kind of we're sh shutting down. Remember, we're removing our nucleus and we're removing our organelles in order to become a mature erythrocyte. So we have an excuse me, acidophilic cytoplasm, which means red, large amount of hemoglobin, no division. It's a normal blast, which means it's normal size now. We've now starting to get to our 7.8 micrometers in diameter. Extrusion of nucleus. What do you think that means? Get out of here. It's getting out. So it's ready to pass, okay? So what's happening is, is that it's now ready to start squeezing out, like we talked about in the previous, through the endothelium into the sinusoidal cavity. Closer to the end, we have the polychromatophilic erythrocyte. This is also called a reticulocyte. It has a reticular network of polyribosomes. About 1 to 2% of the blood, um, red, red, excuse me, red blood cells content is this. So we have a reticular count of about 1 to 2%. And we're going to see our Howell Jolly bodies. Remember that? We're going to see our remnants of our nucleus, Howell Jolly bodies. And any increased number of reticulocytes, um, reticulocytes in, means that we're having reticular cytosis. And usually that is um, trauma. Um, we've had a loss of blood, and so this is a normal natural process that red blood cells are trying to increase their numbers in order to replace what was lost. So we still have mitochondria and endosomes. We're not quite done because, remember, the final product of all of this is called our erythrocyte, also commonly called our red blood cell. Hemoglobin degradation. Well, at this point in time, remember, 120 days, the red blood cell has met its course about four months. It's time to be recycled in the liver, in the spleen primarily, or into the bone marrow. So we need to recycle the hemoglobin. It's a very valuable protein because we have so many red blood cells. Remember, 144,000 to 440,000 per deciliter. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of blood cells. So we're going to want to recycle our hemoglobin because it just takes too much, too much energy and too much resources in order to re recreate the wheel every time. So we have two different products. We have hem, which is the iron group, and globin, which is the protein group. So in the globin, the amino acid chains are released and they're reused. So this one is degraded and down into its raw amino acids, and then it's rebuilt in the, um, in the area in the spleen, the liver, the bone marrow, in order to recreate the, um, the globin for heme. So heme is separated into two. We have the first path and the second path. Let's talk about the first. So we have a degraded to bilirubin. Bilirubin and albumin go to the liver, and then we have um, bilirubin and glucuronic acid and excreted in the feces as bilirubin digluconoride. So what that means is that when we have bilirubin, all right, um, we don't need it anymore, we either have enough or we have enough iron, it's just not necessary. So this is where we're going to go out the feces, all right, and this is what gives feces its iconic brown brown color. The smell comes from the bacteria in the lower GI tract, but the brown color mainly comes from our uh, degraded bilirubin. So what happens if we don't degrade our bilirubin? What happens if, for example, our um, cystic duct, which is responsible for our bile transmission from our liver as well as the um, gallbladder, gets clogged, either due to an obstruction like a um, gallstone,
or for example it just gets pinched off because of some other congenital abnormality well what we're going to have is we're going to have a condition called jaundice and jaundice is an increase in bilirubin in the general circulation which causes yellow tissue as well as um, a change in the urine more than likely you're going to see the yellow tissue in the um, sclera of the eye as well as they're going to look like a banana they're going to be a yellow man and that's going to be jaundice because of an increase of bilirubin. So what happens normally when we want to recycle? Well, iron enters the spleen in the storage pool as a hemodesirin and ferritin. And remember, we talked about our, um, our transfers um, of hemoglobin was done by our um, albumin. So our transferrin actually transfers our iron. So don't forget about that. Albumin is going to transfer our hemoglobin. And we have our um, transferrin, and that's iron. Okay, so let's move on. All right, we have several different things going on here. Number one, what do you think this is on the left? Well, if you said a red blood cell purging its nucleus and nuclear material, you'd be right. So red blood cell. All right, and usually that's probably going to be the last, so that's going to be a reticulocyte. So here we have the space of dis. Space of dis is always in the liver. This is the this line right here is the endothelial layer in the actual um, hepatic sinusoid, and then we have the space of dis which has covered with microvilli, which you'll learn about later on. But those microvilli are actually the um, the apical modification of the hepatocyte proper. And what I mean by that is that this is open space. Blood goes through, nutrients go through, pills go through. Everything that we dissolved um, in the uh, intestines, in our stomach, goes into the portal system, and then it goes into the hepatic sinusoid. From here, the blood and all of the material, essentially, that's running through is going to have the Kupfer cell, which we've discussed earlier, um, as that's a form of a macrophage in the liver is going to be surrounding in the hepatocytes and then the material is going to um, diffuse through the endothelial layer through its basement membrane into the space of disc and then we have an astronomically increased level of um, surface area from our microvilli apical modifications and our hepatocytes so then we're able to absorb more material you'll see here the hepatic stellate cell which you'll learn about later on and we have a great picture of our hepatic sinusoid right here with our space of disc underneath or inferior to the red line. And that's going to be our apical modifications of the hepatocyte. So this is the hepatocyte. This is the hepatocyte. This is the hepatocyte. This is a red blood cell. That's a red blood cell. That's an artifact. I don't know what that is. So right here, we have the very iconic picture of the spleen and the spleen has what we call barrel like filtration slits and these slits are a modification of the endothelium in the basement membrane of the endothelial cells and what it is is that you have macrophages that can actually put extensions through these little slits and essentially monitor the internal environment of the closed circulation of the um, spleen so that being said this whenever you see this this is always going to be spleen never ever ever will it be anything else and again we have our neutrophil with like a little snowball right here it's got all its little projections on here and you'll learn about that in immunology and macrophages it's got its all extensions right here and these are all receptors to, to make sure that there's nothing that shouldn't be in there that's in there progenitor cell well the common myeloid progenitor cell starts as we've talked about before CMP and we can go to the GMP which is the granocyte monocyte progenitor cell or we can go here which is the megakaryocyte erythroid progenitor cell and from here we become the megakaryoblast or we can become the five <laughs> red blood cell, erythroparesis, yada yada, and we become the red blood cell and we become the megakaryocyte. Okay, so that being said, um, everything that I've talked about here, now when you talk about the um, GMP, I forgot monocytes in a couple slides back, but we have it right here. So we have our neutrophil, our monocyte, we have our basophil and mast cell, and we have our eosinophil, and we have our dendritic cell. You notice that these are all progenitor, 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 okay? So I just kind of shortened up to make it simple.
Okay, so what is this? Well, that's probably going to be mega karyocyte. It's pretty big. It's not usually a conglomeration of cells. It's just one big cell. Now, what about here? Well, if I told you that all of this area was a blood island for erythropoiesis, you would see that these cells are kind of all linked together in this red area, and this is where we're going to have our erythropoiesis. So all these cells, thank God that you don't have to know each one of these different maturation points, but these are going to be where our red blood cell is undergoing erythropoiesis and slowly but surely trying to um, kick out its uh, nucleus and uh, mature. So right here we have a neutrophil, have another neutrophil, neutrophil, lymphocyte, neutrophil. Okay, so you get the point. You can identify some of these cells in their earlier earlier stages. Progenitor cell. Well, we've identified this several times now. Um, the common lymphoid progenitor cell directly is an offshoot of the hematopoietic stem cell. So we have the CLP, and just to give you a brand, this is CMP, common myeloid progenitor cell. And the common lymphoid progenitor cell becomes the pre-T, the pre-B, and we have the pre-NK. And these go on to become T, B, and NK cells. So what's granulopoiesis? Well, granulopoiesis is for our granulocytes. And our granulocytes are going to be all um, from the common myeloid progenitor cell. So common myeloid progenitor cell we're going up in here to our granulocyte monocyte progenitor cell, and we're going to undergo the process of granulopoiesis. Anytime you see poiesis, it's this um, cell creation granule granulocyte, okay? So we have our neutrophil, our basophil, and our eosinophil, and having the progenitors. So all are influenced by cytokines. Remember, they all take about two weeks in the bone marrow, one week for the mitotic or the proliferative phase, and one week for the post-mitotic differentiation and maturation phase. Remember, these cells actually mature in the bone marrow. The other cells, like I talked about the common lymphoid progenitor, T is going to be in thymus, B is in bone marrow. So half of all the polymorphonucleosites leave circulation in about six to eight hours, which we've already covered. All right, then they go into the tissue, try to find something. If they don't, they just die. There's a one to two days in circulation, then destroyed by apoptosis, then phagocytized by the macrophages. Remember, monocyte in circulation, all right, and macrophage in tissue. And also, I'm going to teach you this um, shorthand. This is the macrophage. It's an M with a psi, the Greek symbol for psi. All right? And that's going to be really helpful when you start writing a lot of notes for immuno. You're going to need to use that. So large numbers are in the lumen of the GI tract and the feces. Okay? Well, that would make sense because that's an exposed environment, a mucosal membrane. There's large reserves of the polymorphonucleosides in the bone marrow and freely circulating pool in the vessels. This is great. Marginated pool in the bone marrow can be recruited quickly in dynamic equilibrium with the circulating pool. Remember, the endothelium and also the reticular cells, they have those extensions into the sinusoids that they're monitoring for the environment. If there's a need, i.e., the um, body needs a is fighting an infection, it sends out cytokines or inflammatory cytokines, then what's going to happen is the neutrophil is going to be released. They're going to diapodese, which means squeeze through the endothelium, and they're going to be released in the sinusoids and back into general circulation via the nutrient foramen of the bone marrow. So, um, the fate of hematopoietic stem cells are regulated by transcription factors, which you learned about in Scientific Foundation, signaling molecules, which are hormones, um, um, peptide molecules, cytokines, um, interleukins, erythropoietin, very important, we've already talked about that, that's for RBCs, thrombopoietin, again, that's going to be thrombo, thrombocyte, platelet, okay, and colony stimulating factor, that uh, CSFs, that's going to be for our neutrophils and our white blood cells, cytokines and interleukins. These right here are going to be inflama inflammatory, all right, and they're going to be cell made, all right. So um, that's very important to make sure that you understand this area right here. This is the regulation, and this slide's very very high yield. So we have a different kind of format once we get into our granulocytes. So our monocytes we've already talked about. We essentially go from monocyte to our macrophage. And remember, this is going to be circulation. This is going to be tissue. All right, so granulopoiesis, on the other hand, we have our myeloblast, which then goes to our promyelocyte. And then we diverge into three, depending on cytokines, okay?
So either we becoming a cinephil, a neutrophil, or a basophil, and they all have the suffix myelocyte. So we go from myeloblast, promyelocyte, then we go to whatever we're trying to make, myelocyte, and then we go to the eosinophil, neutrophil, or basophil, metamyelocyte. And here it gets a little weird because neutrophil goes through an extra step, which is the band neutrophil, and then we become an eosinophil, neutrophil, and basophil. So we can say this is like four and a half, and that's five. Okay, so just remember, neutrophil has a special um, little stop there where it becomes the band neutrophil. And you're going to see that this actually does occur in circulation. And you can see some band neutrophils, that's what we call them band cells, or SEGs. Um, you can see them in circulation. So just like our red blood cell with our reticulocyte, you know, it, it needs to get out there quickly because this is really important for inflammation. And also it's one of our first... Um, are first on scene in case there's an inflammation. Just like our red blood cells, I mean our red blood cells transport oxygen and without oxygen we all die. So ID all these cells observed. Well we have a megakaryocyte, megakaryocyte, adipocyte, adipocyte, lymphocyte, and let's say that's a neutrophil, that's a lymphocyte. That could be a monocyte because of a little hump. We're still in development, we don't know for sure. Lymphocyte, maybe in the middle of doing something, that's for sure, neutrophil, uh, monocyte, monocyte, that's a basophil right there. So as you can tell, we can go, and this is an excellent opportunity for you to practice the skills that we learned in our blood chapter. It's erythropoiesis. Just like I said, we're going to have a segmented island where we're going to have one um, actually encouraging red blood cell growth, and the other one's going to be for our white blood cell, and in the form of granulopoiesis, which we've already talked about, was going to be our basophil, and we have our eosinophil, and we have our neutrophil. Okay, so those undergo their um, divisions. Okay, and remember, neutrophil special. It has the pro, um, excuse me, the band neutrophil. Okay. Okay, so here we have an excellent example of our bone marrow again, and here we have an adipocyte. How do we know it's an adipocyte? Well, now we can see red blood cells. Red blood cells that are fully formed, and this is gonna be our sinusoid now. So these are adipocyte, 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 adipocyte. All right, sinusoid. Look at the red blood cells. Take in the whole picture. Be like a pathologist. You take a step back. What is this tissue? What does it look like? What am I looking at? So we have our red blood cells, and just draw the line. The red blood cells aren't leaking out, are they? So this line was originally incorrect. Look how big this sinusoid is. It's irregular, right? Because these bones have spicules, right? So we could say here's a spicule. And what happens is, is that these cells that are developing, they form adhesions to these spicules. And from here, they can kind of grow and they can mature. And they can form their own compartments so that they can have erythropoiesis or granulopoiesis or lymphopoiesis. Well, it's dependent on our... Um, transcription factors that actually encourage the development and growth. So this is the main site is in the bone marrow. Proliferation occurs in the peripheral lymphatic organs. So proliferation occurs, not our main site of development. And what that means is that you start with one T, okay? It goes to the thymus. It undergoes positive and negative selection, which you'll learn about later. So positive and negative selection. And then from here, it goes into the circulation, into the lymph node, and it just kind of sits and waits for a couple of days. If it doesn't find anything, it goes back into circulation, goes to another lymph node, and bam, we have a bacterium. Okay? And so the bacterium is going to be taken by the lymph fluid. We're going to have our neutrophil um, be activated here, or excuse me, our T cell be activated. Our T cell in our lymph node is going to activate our B cells that are in the lymph node because B cells are also in our peripheral, peripheral lymphatic organs after they start from the bone marrow. So here's the bone marrow, and here's our B, and B undergoes selection here, and then B goes right into the lymph nodes and waits. And then you'll learn about that later on this semester, about where they wait, how they wait, what they do, okay? So what happens is, is that they wait there and they wait for the infection. So let's talk about in the bone marrow when we undergo the initial, do we do a B, a T, or an NK cell? Well, Pre-Ts are always made by the influence of the cytokine GATA3, G-A-T-A-3.
and the, the pre T cell leaves and matures in the thymus. Once it becomes a pre T cell from the cytokine uh, interaction with the hematopoietic stem cell and the common lymphoid progenitor cell, it goes to the thymus, and this we have long lived T cells, and they live from days to decades. So a memory T cell is an amazing, amazing um, cell. It can last for 10, 20 years, okay? So our pre B depends on PAX5. PAX5 is a cytokine that develop and occurs in the bursa equivalent organs of the bone marrow and in the GALT, in the small intestine. GALT is the um, gastrointestinal associated lymphatic tissue, okay? And usually, um, it's usually called MALT, which is mucosal associated lymphatic tissue. But you need to know that PAX5 causes the development of the B cell from the CLP, or the common lymphoid progenitor cell, and then from there it undergoes development, and then it goes and waits in the GALT. So either we can go into the lymphatic node, or we can go into the GALT. And the GALT waits until a bacterium is um, presented to it, and after it's presented, it proliferates, all right, and then it goes to a lymph node, and then from there, it is activated even more by a T cell, it recruits inflammatory cytokines, so on and so forth, which you'll learn about later. So IL-2 and IL-15 actually activate the pre-NK cell. They actually encourage the CLP to become pre-NK, and that's going to be in the bone marrow, and they're also in the fetal thymus and the lymph node. NK cells are very important because they're actually um, really super cool for when it comes to intracellular pathogens, either bacterial, viral, or fungal. And um, they will actually destroy the cell if they, the cell is actually infected and it actually puts another presentation on its cellular surface. So just to draw this out, we have the CLP going to our three different things. So we have our pre-T, we have our pre-B, and we have our pre-NK. And I'm going to change the color just to demonstrate what happens. So we have GATA3, we have our PAX5, and we have our IL-2 and 15. Remember, IL stands for interleukin, and it's a cellular chemical that actually stimulates growth and change. Thrombopoiesis. Well, it's thrombo, thrombocyte. It's our um, platelets. And remember, platelets come from megakaryocytes that originate from megakaryoblasts. So remember, we have our common myeloid progenitor that goes into our um, megakaryocyte erythroid progenitor. And then from here, I'm going to add the um, red blood cell. So remember, red blood cell times 5. And we have our megakaryoblast that then is further matured into our megakaryocyte. All right, so our our megakaryocyte erythroid progenitor cell becomes a megakaryoblast progenitor cell or megakaryoblast and thrombopoietin so we'll just change the color and you'll learn about all this in biochem when you start having to add pluses and minuses for um, augmenters and inhibitors but we have thrombopoietin okay and this encourages our production to be amplified alright and the megakaryocyte increases platelets all right, and pl this is occurred by the platelet demarcation channels pinching off through the endothelial wall of the sinusoidal cavity. Okay, so here we have our platelet demarcation channels right here. We've already discussed this in blood. I hope that you uh, know it, it's very important. And we can tell that we have our big blood cells right here. So this is a megakaryocyte, that's a megakaryocyte, okay? And let's talk about some of these areas right here. We see red blood cells right here. If you look closely, you can see that they're kind of on top of one another, almost like a rouleau pattern. And that's probably because this has been stained and all sorts of stuff. So um, it's kind of violent when it was taken out. But you can see the sinusoid right here, big sinusoid. And again, we start to look right here. This would probably be a place where we're either having lymphopoiesis, granulopoiesis, or erythropoiesis. Cells, we've already looked at this slide. Megakaryocyte, megakaryocyte. We have our sinusoid right here. We have another sinusoid. It's a big one. Essentially, all of these red blood cells and wherever the lumen's at, okay? We have a site of lymphopoiesis, a really big conglomeration. Really nice example of um, eosinophil, eosinophil, eosinophil eosinophil, eosinophil, eosinophil. Okay, do we see any basophils? Uh, let's see here, I don't see any basophils just readily. 
If you find one, great. I didn't find one, but they're in there. Okay, again, adipocyte, 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 okay? We see a sinusoid right here. Look at the red blood cells, okay? All right. Again, um, the adipocytes are going to be washed out because we use the alcohol to remove them when we fixate the slide. Again, this is a megakaryocyte. We have another sinusoidal space. These red um, blobs right here are going to be our erythrocytes, okay? So you'll notice that um, we have a really big sinusoid right here. And some of it may be due to artifact because it's been broken up. We have an eosinophil right there. That's probably a basophil. Um, basophil, basophil. Look how much bigger the megakaryocytes are versus all the other cells. That's, I mean, it's a really big cell. You can pretty much guess, hey, that's not going to be a basophil. Not a lymphocyte. It's a megakaryocyte.